Alhamdulillah, we reached verse number 42 of Surah an Naj. And as you recall from our last session, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the scriptures of Musa and Harun. There are certain concepts and certain beliefs that we have in the Islamic tradition that were also mentioned in previous revelations. And this is basically a continuation of what is in the Suhufi Musa, what is, what, are, what is mentioned in the scriptures of Musa and Ibrahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَىٰ That the ultimate end is unto your Lord. Now, إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَىٰ This verse conveys a sense of the day of judgment, where everyone will stand before Allah Azza wa Jal for reckoning. That we're all on a journey, irrespective of who you are. Believer, non-believer, man, woman, everyone is on a journey and the destination, the direction is Allah Azza wa Jal. It's unavoidable. In fact, there's a beautiful there's a beautiful statement recorded by Imam al kazim alayhi salam. You know, brothers and sisters, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam spent over a decade in the prisons of Harun al-Rashid. And the Imam alayhi salam actually writes a letter to Harun. So the Imam alayhi salam is in prison and the only way that he's able to communicate to Harun al-Rashid, the Abbasid Khalifa, is that he writes, him a, he writes him a letter with the following statement. Among the things that the Imam says to Harun is, إِنَّهُ لَنْ يَنْقَضِيَ عَنِّي يَوْمٌ مِنَ الْبَلَاءِ إِلَّا انْقَضَى عَنْكَ مَعَهُ يَوْمٌ مِنَ الرَّخَاءِ حَتَّى نَقْضِي جَمِيعًا إِلَى يَوْمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ انْقِضَاء the Imam السلام, tells Harun that, O oh, Harun, know that not a single day, that whenever a day of hardship and trial ends for me, alongside it, a day of comfort and ease also ends for you. Until our days end, and we meet Allah Azza wa Jal on the final day of reckoning. The Imam alayhi salam is essentially reminding Harun al-Rashid of this ayah. وَأَنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَىٰ Harun al-Rashid, he's enjoying the comforts and the luxuries of life. But Imam al-Kazim alayhi salam is essentially telling him that I'm in the prison now. I'm in these dungeons. And the days of my hardships are also ending in the same way that the days of your comfort and ease are ending. And as these days draw to an end, we are approaching the day in which the wrongdoers will be at loss. So the Imam السلام, is reminding Harun al-Rashid that we are ultimately all going to meet Allah. We're all headed towards the same end. That's, it, it's inescapable. So this ultimate end that is mentioned in this ayah, وَأَنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَىٰ is a reference to the day of Qiyamah, that we're all headed towards this day. Whether you're enjoying days of comfort or you're suffering at the moment, these 24 hours will end and the next day will end and eventually the ultimate end will be with Allah Azza wa Jal. Now there's an interesting hadith that I came across today where Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq actually gives us another perspective on this verse. Because you know, brothers and sisters, the Qur'an has many layers. Sometimes you read a verse and it conveys a certain meaning. And then you might return to that verse and that same verse can shed light on a topic that, that didn't even cross your mind when you first read it. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq 
when he read this verse, he made the following comment. He says, Where the Imam says, when speech ends with God, you has you stop. Meaning that when you speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can speak about his attributes, you can speak about his creation. But when you want to speak about his essence, that's when you have to stop. Because the human mind cannot comprehend the unlimited nature of God, the infinite nature of the Creator. So the Imam alayhi salam, when he reflects on this verse, wa anna ila rabbika al-munta, that the ultimate end is unto your Lord, meaning that the exercise of reflection and contemplation ends when you want to reflect upon the essence of God, the nature of God. The Holy Prophet ﷺ in a hadith, he says, Tafakkaru fi kulli shay. Reflect and think about whatever you want. Think about anything. Wala tufakkiru fi dhatillah. But do not ponder over the essence of God. Don't try to understand how God doesn't have a beginning. Or how God is infinite. Or how God can be in all places at all times. Because your mind cannot fathom these realities. So, وَأَنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَىٰ is an implicit instruction that we should not delve too deeply into the realm of trying to understand the nature of God. Because otherwise you will be bewildered. You'll be, you'll be confused. You'll be dumbfounded. وَأَنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَىٰ Imam al-Sadiq says, when you reach the essence of God, that's when you have to come to a halt. You have to stop. You cannot continue pondering and reflecting because you're not going to get anywhere because you're an in, you're a finite being who's trying to understand and comprehend the infinite wa anna ila rabbika al-muntaha then in ayah number 43 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa annahu huwa adhaka wa abka that it is he who causes laughter and weeping. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of the human being. He's the creator of all things. But he, Allah is not only the creator of the human being, He's also the creator of human emotion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who causes laughter and weeping. You know, brothers and sisters, it's important for mu'mineen to strike a balance with their emotions. It's natural to weep. You know, sometimes we have this idea that sadness is a negative emotion, that we should suppress it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah highlights that sadness, that weeping, is as natural as laughter and happiness. So we have to embrace all of the emotions that we experience. We have to embrace all of the emotions on the spectrum of human emotion. Laughter, happiness, joy, sadness. There's a hadith from our imams where they they make an interesting comparison between Yahya, John the Baptist, and Isa ibn Maryam, and they were cousins. Ahlul Bayt salam, the Imams, they say, Kana Yahya ibn Zakana Yahya ibn Zakariya yabki wa la yadhak. Yahya salam was a very serious person. If you read some of the biographical information on the life of Yahya, you'll find that he was a very intense person. He was very serious. And the hadith says that Yahya used to cry, he used to weep, and he never used to laugh. 
وكان عيسى بن مريم يضحك ويبكي أهل البيت عليهم السلام they say but عيسى عليه السلام used to laugh and he used to cry there was more of a balance with his emotions وكان الذي يصنع عيسى أفضل من الذي كان يصنع يحيى the أهل البيت عليهم السلام they say what Jesus used to do was better than what Yahya used to do. Meaning, it's better to be balanced when it comes to your emotions. You shouldn't always be crying, and you shouldn't always be laughing. You have to be balanced. You see, brothers and sisters, unfortunately, especially in our communities, there's this idea that if someone is sad, that it's an indication that their iman is weak. There's this idea that mu'mineen should always be happy, that a believer should not experience sadness because sadness is an indication that their iman is weak. But this is the furthest from the truth because sadness is a natural, it's a natural God-given emotion. وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ أَضْحَكَ وَأَبْكَ The Holy Prophet experience sorrow rasulullah was a very cheerful person he was a very joyful individual but he was also he had times where he was sad where he wept when rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi lost his wife khadija alayhi salam in the shi'ab the mountain hideout of abu talib and when he loses his uncle the Holy Prophet grieved intensely to such an extent that he called the entire year Amul Huzn. So, is a reminder that even our emotions come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That this is another aspect of Tawheed that we have to understand. That everything, that the root cause of everything that we see is Allah Azza wa Jal. Even our emotions. And we have to embrace the laughter, the, the joy, the happiness, as well as the sadness and the sorrow. Because they both have a purpose. وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ أَضْحَكَ وَأَبْكَ In ayah number 44, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ أَمَاتَ وَأَحْيَا That it is he who causes death and gives life. It's interesting that when you look at this verse, Allah makes mention of death before life. وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ أَمَاتَ وَأَحْيَا that it is he who causes death. So the causing of death is mentioned first. And he's the one that gives life. The Mufassirin of the Holy Quran have noted that perhaps the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions death before life is because human beings have a tendency to be heedless of their mortality. That we recognize life, right? We celebrate life, but we tend to ignore death. We act as though it's it's not something that's going to happen. We say that we believe in death, but we don't conduct ourselves in a way that reflects our certainty in death. There, you know, there's a hadith that Dawood alayhi salam, who was a king. He was a prophet and he was also a king, just like Sulaiman. So Dawood is the father of Sulaiman. Malakul Maut visits him one day to take his soul. It's the last day of his life. Malakul Maut arrives to take the soul of Dawood. Dawood السلام, says, Why? He tells Malakul Maut that how can I how come I didn't receive any warning? that you would be coming today. I'm a prophet. I had I anticipated that I would receive a heads up, some type of warning of your arrival. 
ملك الموت says to Dawood, Ya Dawood, where is your father? Dawood alayhi salam says, he passed away, he died. Malik al then asks, where is your mother? Dawood says she also passed away. Where is your aunt? Where are your aunts, your uncles? Where are your relatives, your grandparents? They all died. They all perished. Malakul Mawt says to Dawood, is this not enough of a warning? Isn't this a warning? All these people around you have passed away. Why do you need a warning that I'm, I will come to you? The departure of your loved ones is the warning that this day will come. Now some have also read this verse as a reference to spiritual life and death. So on the one hand, you can read this verse as Allah is the one who causes death and He gives life in the literal sense. He gives biological life and He takes away this life. But we can also read it as a reference to spiritual life and spiritual death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Anfal, Surah number 8, verse 24, Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu istajibu lillahi wa lirrasool idha da'akum lima yuhyikum O you who believe, Respond to the invitation of God and His Messenger when they invite you to that which gives you life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the reviver of the hearts that turn to Him. And He's also the one who causes the hearts that turn away from Him to die. Because my dear brothers and sisters, dhikrullah, Remembrance of God, God consciousness, this is like the oxygen of the heart. When someone cuts this connection, this is what causes death. So Allah gives life to those who turn to Him and He takes away life. He causes death to those who turn away from Him. This is why the Quran strongly condemns shirk and kuf associated partners with God, disbelieving in God, because these are things that cause the spiritual heart to die. You know, brothers and sisters, when, we, when the Qur'an speaks about life and death, it's important for us, you know, even though it's the year 2018 and we've come a long way, scientifically we've made so many discoveries as a human as a human race we are very scientifically advanced however life and death remain a mystery to scientists there's not a single scientist in the world today that can confidently comment on the origin of life until today with all of our discoveries, well, with all of the information at our disposal, you bring the greatest minds together, we still don't understand the origin of life. It remains a mystery. We, have, we, we understand how living organisms function, but we don't know how the story of life began. It remains a mystery to the scientific world. And what's equally mysterious is death. Even an atheist still grapples with this, with the notion of death and mortality. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that truly understands the nature of life and the nature of death. In ayah number 45, Again, as a reminder, brothers and sisters, these verses that I'm mentioning are all a continuation of what was recorded in the Suhuf, 
in the scriptures of Musa and Ibrahim. As you recall last week, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Alam am lam yunabba' bima fi su'ufi Musa wa Ibrahim alladhi waffa an la tazur waziratun wazir ukhra. So it is a continuation of what is mentioned in the scriptures of Musa and Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Allah says, وَأَنَّهُ خَلَقَ الزَّوْجَيْنَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى And that he created the two mates, the male and female. Brothers and sisters, if you look at creation, if you look at the universe, if you look at life on earth, you'll find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a very beautiful duality in creation. There is male and female in the animal kingdom. You find that there is male and female, there are pairs, there are sexes even in the plant kingdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is mentioned in Surah Qaf, verse number seven. So this idea that Allah has created everything in pairs as male and female, the presence of the sexes is alluded to in this verse. We know that it exists in the animal world and only up until recently, we discovered that it also exists in the plant, in the plant kingdom. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 7 of Surah Qaf, Surah number 50, ayah number 7, He says, وَالْأَرْضَ مَدَدْنَاهَا Allah says that we have flattened the earth. وَأَلْقَيْنَا فِيهَا رَوَاسِيَ Allah has placed firm mountains on the earth. وَأَنْبَتْنَا فِيهَا مِنْ كُلِّ زَوْجٍ بَهِيجٍ And Allah mentions that he has made the earth produce plants that are zoj, that are pairs, that have this duality, this male and female, this, the sexes even in the plants. Even if you look at the inanimate objects, even if you look at the atom, there is this duality even on the atomic level. So you have positively charged particles and negatively charged particles you have you know the protons and the electrons so in the world of creation there is this duality there is male and female there is you know light there is light and darkness day and night truth and falsehood and you find even among human beings even even among Beings that possess free will, you have Shaytan, who is the epitome of evil. And you have on the other side of the spectrum, you have the Ma'asum. Right? So if Shaytan has the power to misguide, even if we cannot see him, because no one can see Shaytan, but Shaytan is able to misguide even when he's not visible. Similarly, the Imam, the Ma'asum, who's on the other side of the, of the spectrum, has the ability to guide even when he's unseen. You know, many people ask, what's the use of the Imam if he's in Ghaybah? We say his, his function is that he guides. In the same way that Shaytan inspires your heart to do evil, Allah's justice necessitates that there is something to counteract this evil force, which is the ma'asum. So in the same way that shaitan can inspire your heart to commit evil, to commit sin, the imam, imam sahib al-zaman, has that guiding potential to inspire your heart to do good. You can't see Iblis, but you know that he still has the power to influence. Similarly, we believe that the Imam, even though we cannot see him, he has the power to influence us to do good. 
So again, when Allah says, وَأَنَّهُ خَلَقَ الزَّوْجَيْنِ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى It's another reminder of the beauty of Allah's creation. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is behind this duality that we see. That not only does He create life, but he has designed a system where living things have the ability to replicate and procreate. And this is also another one of the mysteries. You know, scientists, they don't know the origin of life and they can't even explain what caused the first living cell to self-replicate. These are all mysteries. وَأَنَّهُ خَلَقَ الزَّوْجَيْنِ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى in, in ayah number 46, مِن نُطْفَةٍ إِذَا تُمْنَى From a drop when emitted. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the Qur'an cites the creation of man from a single drop as evidence of his ability to resurrect them. So for those who doubt Allah's power to bring back all of humanity, those who've passed away and who've become dust in the ground, Allah says, I created you from a single drop. It's not difficult for me to resurrect those who have passed away. And when we reflect on this verse, when we reflect on the fact that Allah created all of us, every single human being that you see roaming the earth today, their creation began as a single cell. So this walking, talking, complex organism at one time was a single cell. As Allah says in Surah Al-Insan, هَلْ أَتَى عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ حِينٌ مِّنَ الدَّهَ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْئًا مَذْكُورًا Was there not a time when the human being was something so insignificant, not even worth mentioning? You were a single cell that even the naked eye could not see. So when we reflect on this, it should humble us. When Allah tells us that He created us min min idha tumna, it's a reminder that we have to be humble, that we should not be arrogant. This is why Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib salam <coughs> in a beautiful hadith. He says, عَجِبْتُ لِبْنِ آدَمِ The Imam says, I am amazed at the son of Adam. What is, what, what, why is the Imam amazed? عَجِبْتُ لِبْنِ آدَمِ أَوَّلُهُ نطفة. I am amazed at the human being, at the son of Adam. His beginning was a nutfa, it was a single drop. وَآخِرُهُ جِيفًا And his end is a rotting, filthy, foul-smelling corpse. So the beginning of your journey, your story, is you're a single cell. So small, so insignificant, so fragile, so weak. And the end in this earthly life is a corpse. Jifa, something that's very foul in their smell. If you've ever been to the morgue, my dear brothers and sisters, believe me, you would not be able to be in the same room as a dead body because you would want to vomit because of how foul the odor is. This is why, you know, they put the dead body in a freezer because the body begins to decompose begins to break down, it begins to rot. Amir al-Mu'mini says, عَجِبْتُ لِبْنِ أَوَّلُهُ نُطْفَ His beginning is a single drop. وَآخِرُهُ جِيفَ And his end is a corpse. وَهُوَ قَائِمٌ بَيْنَهُمَا وِعَاءٌ لِلْغَائِضِ So Imam mentions the beginning of man and the end. The beginning was a single drop. The end was a rotting corpse. How about the middle? The Imam says, and in between, he was a vessel for waste. 
if you look at the, the body, how much waste is in your body? The Imam says your beginning is a single drop. Your end is a rotting corpse. And in between, you are a vessel for waste. The Imam says, and after that, man has the audacity to be arrogant. How can you be arrogant? How can you be boastful when you come from such an insignificant origin that you have such an end? No matter how much money you have, your body is going to smell, it's going to decompose, it's going to break down, and you're a vessel for waste. In the next ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَأَنَّ عَلَيْهِ النَّشْأَةَ الْأُخْرَى and that with him lies the second creation. The second creation here is a reference to Alam al Brothers and sisters, the fact that Allah calls the hereafter a second creation or a second genesis is an indication that the akhirah, the hereafter, is so drastically different from this earthly life that Allah calls it an nash'at al ukhra a second creation. The difference between dunya and akhirah is so immensely vast that you can't even fathom it. وَأَنَّ عَلَيْهِ النَّشْأَةَ الْأُخْرَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran he speaks about the hereafter and how unknown it is to us. Now we may be familiar with this life, you know, even our earthly life, there's a lot of things that we don't know about dunya. But about akhira, we're totally ignorant. Allah says, نَحْنُ قَدَّرْنَا بَيْنَكُمُ الْمَوْتِ وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمَسْبُقِينَ That we have decreed death among you, and we are not to be overcome. Allah has decreed death upon us. عَلَىٰ أَن نُبَدِّلَ أَمْثَالَكُمْ وَنُنْشِئَكُمْ فِي مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ From changing your forms and creating again in a form unknown to you. وَنُنْشِئَكُمْ فِي مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah is saying that we are going to create you in a way and in a world that is totally unknown to you. The laws that govern the hereafter are drastically different from the laws that govern this earthly life. So Allah says, وَأَنَّ عَلَيْهِ النَّشْأَةَ الْأُخْرَى And with Him lies the second creation. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring us into a new world, into a new realm. It's like, a, it's like a brand new creation, a different world. وَأَنَّهُ In the next verse, وَأَنَّهُ Ayah number 48, وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ أَغْنَى وَأَقْنَى That it is He who enriches and grants possessions. Meaning that Allah Azza wa Jal gives you what you need. He makes you free of want, of need. And He also gives you even more than that. Allah doesn't only give you the bare minimum. He gives you what you need. And He also gives you even more than what you need. And this, brothers and sisters, again, you know, all of these verses are essentially revolving around the concept of Tawheed. So Allah is the, the one that causes, you know, everything returns to God. Allah is the causer of death and the giver of life. Allah Azza wa Jal is the, he's the creator of, he's the creator of the, of the two mates, Dhakr wal Untha. He's the one that created you from a single drop. He's the one that will recreate you in Alam al Akhir. It all revolves around Tawheed. And here, He is the one who enriches you and grants you possessions. Anything that you acquire in this world, even if it's through work, He's the one who's providing. 
That's why, brothers and sisters, you know, people ask me this question all the time. You know, Sheikh, I have an interview coming up. And the hiring committee, the head of the hiring committee is a woman or a man. And I'm afraid that if I don't shake their hands, I might not get the job. I'm afraid that if I don't attend this luncheon at work where alcohol is being served at the table, I might not be considered for this promotion. That I need to, you know, develop a relationship with some of my colleagues and they drink. But Sheikh, I'm going to sit on the table, but I'm not going to drink. We have this tendency that we want to compromise our principles because there is a potential for financial gain. Because there's an opportunity to move up, you know, the corporate ladder, for example. Allah in the Quran here says, وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ أَغْنَى وَأَغْنَى That He is the one who enriches. Why are you trying to appease the makhluq? Allah Azza wa Jal, He's the one that has full control of your affairs. Your promotion is in His hands. If Allah wants you to be promoted, it's going to happen even if your boss hates you. And Allah Azza wa Jal, if it's not in His qadar, if it's not in His, if it's not His will, for you to get that promotion, even if you're best friends with the with the CEO, it's not going to happen. You really have to believe that Allah exercises full control. He is the one who enriches. He is the sustainer. This is why there's a beautiful hadith where Allah says to Musa, He says, Ya Musa, Selni an kullima tahtaju ilay. O Musa, ask me about all of your needs. You know, we have a tendency, we ask Allah, we make dua when, when it's something significant. You know, if I want a job, I ask Allah. If I want a promotion, I ask Allah. But usually we only ask, we only turn to him when it comes to the big events in our lives. But here Allah says to Musa, O oh Musa, ask me about everything. Oh Musa, ask me about all of your needs. Even the food, the hay this, for your sheep and salt for your food. Something as simple and trivial as that turned to me. Imam Zain al-Abidin when the strap of his sandal would snap, he would ask Allah to help him repair his sandal. Because the ma'sumin, they understand that they are totally powerless before Allah. That he is the one who provides. Imam Amir al Mu'minin, السلام, he says, La yam liku imsak al arzaq wa idraraha illa al razzaq. Amir al Mu'minin, he says, No one has the power to withhold your sustenance or bestow upon you sustenance except the sustainer. So as a mu'min, you have to have this yaqeen, this confidence that if Allah Azza wa Jal decrees that this is my rizq, it's going to come to me. But if Allah Azza wa Jal has decreed that it's not for you, it's not going to happen. So you should put effort to please Him. You should seek His help. You should supplicate to Him. And you should never compromise your principles. Because that it is he who enriches and grants possessions. This is why Isa alayhi salam, you know, if you were to think of you know who is the poorest prophet, Isa alayhi salam was probably one of the poorest. Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, son of Mary, he didn't have a house. Amir al-Mu'mineen speaks about his zuhd in Nahj al that he never had a house. He used to eat of whatever used to grow from the earth. His pillow 
Amir al Muminin says, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says, his pillow at night was a rock, was a stone. His lamp was the moon. His ceiling, his roof was the sky. His transportation were his legs. He didn't even have a horse or a camel or a donkey. Completely simple life. But Isa alayhi salam, he says, but there is no one who is wealthier than me. This is a man, from a materialistic standpoint, he doesn't have anything. But Isa alayhi salam, he says, there is no one who is wealthier than me. Why? Because, yeah, there are others who may have gifts that I don't have, but I am closer to the giver than they are. You have the gifts, but I have the giver. So this is the attitude that we have to instill in our hearts, that we have to adopt. وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ أَغْنَى وَأَقْنَى And then ayah number 49. وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ رَبُّ الشِّعْرَى That it is he who is the Lord of Sirius. Shi'ra is a reference to a star. Sirius, it's spelled S-I-R-I-U-S. The pre-Islamic Arabs used to worship many things. You know, they have their idols. But as I mentioned in our previous sessions that human beings have a tendency to associate perfection with things that are elevated. So because they, they used to see this bright, shining, celestial body, they used to make it their, the object of their worship. So Allah Azza wa Jal speaking to, to these people, to this polytheistic culture, He's saying to them that that star, because Shi'ara, as it's called in Arabic, Sirius, is a, is a star at night that appears bright, it's one of the brightest stars in the night sky. So because it was so luminous, it attracted their eyes and the Arabs in the pre-Islamic era, they used to worship the star. But here Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, وَأَنَّهُ هُوَ رَبُّ الشِّعْرَى That you know that star that you used to worship, that you used to prostrate to? That Allah, that He is the Lord of that star. And notice that Allah doesn't say, Allah doesn't say He's the creator of that star. Even more than that, He is the sustainer of that star. He created it and He continues to sustain that star that you see in the sky. It's continuously dependent on Him. So this verse returns to the theme uh, in verses 19 to 30, which emphasizes that Allah Azza wa Jal is the Lord of all things. He's the Lord of even these, the idols and the stars that the pre-Islamic Arabs used to worship. We'll conclude here for tonight, brothers and sisters. Inshallah, in our next session, we'll finish the tafsir of Surah An-Najj. There's not enough time to go into enough detail about the next verses. If there are any questions, inshallah, we can take uh, some questions.